Meredith Ricefield, Director of Carbon Policy and Strategic Partnerships at Indigo, and I'm here with Matt Ramlow from the World Resources Institute, and we're going to talk scope three accounting and target setting and mm -hmm. what the process of developing those guidances looks like. Yeah, sounds great. So Matt, I'm hoping you can start by telling us about your career background and your current work at WRI. Yeah, sure. So um, just a little bit of how I kind of got to where I am today. Um, when I first started my career, I was really looking for where there's opportunities um, to help incentivize the mitigation action that we know we need. You know, we weren't too sure on the federal policy front if there was going to be much. So I, I first kind of got my start in uh, voluntary carbon markets, working for some of the standard settings there where I got into the methodologies and accounting frameworks. Um, and I, I was really interested in the agriculture, forestry, and other land use sector. So through a lot of those opportunities, met some of the kind of leading experts who are running the US national inventory out at Colorado State. And I did a PhD in soil ecology out there, kind of getting to do some field trials, both in an agriculture and forestry setting. Um, that also gave me some great opportunities to work. Uh, you know, they leverage their expertise and do capacity building workshops internationally. Um, so uh, after I finished my PhD, I worked with a consulting group that I'd met up with um, to do capacity workshops in developing countries out in Kenya, Uganda, Papua New Guinea, um, which was a you know very unique experience really getting to, to work with some of these experts in the global south and understanding um, some of the knowledge that they bring of their agricultural systems. Um, but after that, I, I kind of wanted the opportunity to, to work a little bit closer to home on um, some of the issues within our own uh, agriculture and forestry value chains and um, saw this opportunity with the greenhouse gas protocol uh, and thought it was a perfect fit. So um, I've been on the team now for the last four years at World Resources Institute working to develop uh, land sector and removals guidance through a global multi-stakeholder process. And so as you've traveled all over the world doing those field trials and that capacity building, what kind of sense of urgency have you seen and how are you perhaps thinking about some of the work you're doing with that global lens? Obviously, a lot of the impacts of climate change are starting to be felt all over, and, and I think a lot of the producers are recognizing um, the role not only uh, to, to kind of mitigate, but also to adapt to some of the impacts of climate change. Um, and I think that you, you really see a lot of new opportunities that are taking place with some of these value chains. I think agriculture hadn't really been the focus of conversation for the, the longest time. You know, more of our mitigation efforts were, were really focused on the, the power sector. Um, but I think as more and more companies are, are trying to understand the impacts, they realize that, you know, we have, uh, studies that are showing that about a third of greenhouse gas emissions can be attributed to food systems, about 25% within the agriculture and forestry and land use sector. So if we don't really bring these uh, sort of mitigation opportunities into the picture, we're, we're not gonna be able to achieve our targets. So I think with that kind of increased scrutiny that we're seeing, um, we understand a need to, to, to you know, improve our value chains to reduce food loss and waste and, and to really tackle it from all the different mitigation opportunities there are out there, so. Yeah, I'd love to dig in a little bit deeper mm -hmm. on that. So you've talked about the massive impact of food and ag. You're talking about the increased scrutiny that's coming. There's also this shift that we're seeing in the space with the emergence of SBTI's flag guidance, mm -hmm. with the progress on the land sector and removals guidance that you're working on. What kind of shift are you seeing in this space for people to try to get their arms around their impact and come up with a strategy to mitigate it? Yeah, well, so, so maybe like I was saying before, I think where companies kind of started on their sustainability journey, a lot of it was looking at the impacts within their energy use. Um, so there was a lot of companies that were developing their scope one um, uh, inventories around, you know, the operations they own and control or scope two from the purchased electricity or steam and heat that they um, uh, that they have, but then as they began to look more broadly within scope three and over after the greenhouse gas protocol released the scope three standard about a decade ago, um, there's just been increased scrutiny and, and understanding that about 90% of the impacts are, are coming or possibly even more from, from their value chains. So I think with that and with the science-based targets initiative that put more emphasis on the, the full value chain picture and setting targets around not only scope one and two, but also scope three, you had a lot of consumer goods companies who you know really want to align with the science and to understand what we need to decarbonize, um, recognizing that a lot of that impact is in scope three. And when they were doing their accounting, they, they found that there were a lot of you know challenges and you know areas that it, it wasn't necessarily clear what was the best accounting approach to, to look upstream and to 
to try to understand your impacts from land use, from you know cropland systems, from forest systems. Um, so that's really what we set to tackle with this guidance is to bring stakeholders, you know, from from all over and from different sectors together to agree on what are international best practices when it comes to accounting. Um, I think the other one that, that you probably see too is uh, around the, the rise of net zero targets. So I think that's also been a fairly recent phenomenon after IPCC released a series of reports that show in order to get to 1.5 C futures, we, we really need to, to think about the role of removing CO2 from the atmosphere, be it you know through natural processes or through new technologies. Um, so, you know, as companies begin to think about their net zero journey and, and what is the role of removals, you know, within their supply chain or, or financing those types of technologies, um, how does that relate to their own, um, you know, agriculture or forestry uh, supply chain? So that's uh, another area that we've, we've been focusing on is, uh, you know, removals hadn't previously been in the corporate greenhouse gas inventory accounting picture. Um, so how do we bring that into the framework um, in a, you know, robust way so that there is credible reporting on action occurring. So you're building on all this momentum in the space and you've talked about the large volume of corporate interest and kind of aligning with the science and getting this right. Where are you most optimistic as all these pieces come together and what kind of challenges do you see still in front of us? One thing that brings me optimism is just the variety of solutions that are being pursued. Um, I think that agriculture, forestry, and other land use sector is, is a bit uniquely poised because there's not one single bullet that's going to solve everything, and you, and you really have to innovate within different systems. So I think on the supply side of things, it's really thinking about, uh, I, I think you can kind of bucket it in half where half of the picture is around reducing deforestation and other land use change. So that, you know, requires a lot of different solutions where where um, it's thinking about where companies are sourcing from, but also engaging with um, countries to, to, you know, develop better land tenure policy and to, to really tackle this from a broader jurisdictional scale as well. And we're seeing a lot of initiatives on the ground trying to do that type of work. Um, but then when you get into the specific farms, you know, there's a lot of opportunities to improve within our existing pr production system, all, whether that's, you know, trying to reduce some of the impact from livestock, trying to think about better nitrogen management practices, um, where hopefully we can also um, not only be reducing greenhouse gases, but also increasing the productivity of our food systems and, and increase efficiencies there. And, and I think hope we we see a lot of interest in you know bringing more investment to, to support farmers and other producers in, in that space. Um, but it's not just the supply side, it's also the demand side as well. I think there's a lot of work, especially for companies that are further down the supply chain, um, you know, retailers, restaurants, to think about how they can reduce their own food loss and waste within the system, um, or think about other uh, sort of diet shifting opportunities to, to move to more low carbon menu. And, you know, some of my colleagues at WRI have been doing great work within the cool food program where they're they're working to kind of help restaurants think about what different offerings that they can provide to, to reduce some of the impacts of their their own menu. So you've been in the process of developing this guidance for a little while and have some of the final stages in front of you. Can you tell us a little bit more about the process that you've been going through? Where are you now? What next steps still remain? Yeah, it's been a it's been a long process. I think there's a you know it, it takes a lot to, to really bring everybody together around what are the best practices within this space and to, to really make sure that we have a lot of that different sector specific expertise. So um, again, we formed a technical working group with, with experts to develop the guidance where we had feedback on a first draft that um, you know then went through a series of revisions. And then we just recently, uh, last fall, had released a version for public review and pilot testing. Um, and that's been a, a really illuminating process, you know, having, you know, over 300 reviewers provide feedback and um, just shy of 100 pilot testers give us feedback and, and actually road test the guidance to kind of see where we're at in terms of different data sets that are available, their ability to, to look upstream and trace back some of these impacts. And I think now we're getting to a point where we have this more tangible case studies that we can look to of, you know, what is possible now? Where do we think we need to be in the next five, 10 years if we really want to be on track for these targets um, in order to drive the, the mitigation action? 
Um, so the process that we have ahead of us now is to take all of that feedback that we received and um, reconvene our technical working group and bring in some of these pilot testers and reviewers who are sharing new perspectives um, as we kind of finalize the decisions. And you know, I think well, we're trying to do the best we can to get things right in this in this first publication. There's probably going to be a lot of areas where we still need to innovate. We um, I think on the data picture there were a lot of you know great new resources, databases, tools that are being developed in this space that, that we hope to leverage and continue to build on in the coming years. But we also did find gaps um, when it comes to you know things like looking at soil carbon stock changes, looking at carbon stock changes in the forest, um, where we see a lot of room for improvement to you know, help make those connections uh, within supply chains and to drive the right incentives. Yeah, so what kind of innovations are you hoping to see? Oh, it's uh, I don't know. It's it's an exciting space to be in because I think there is a lot of um, groups that are are trying to do good work there and to trying to innovate and you know drive the right incentives. I think I'm most optimistic for uh, different opportunities to really better connect some of the more downstream actors to uh, to lands. I think that's kind of like the, the, the sweet spot that a lot of companies are looking for. You know, they, they don't want to just be able to use uh, secondary databases to, to kind of get general um, uh, picture of, of, you know, the different goods that they source. They, they really want to understand some of the different suppliers and how they, they can, you know, leverage that to achieve their, their targets that they've set. Um, in order to do that, it requires not only having you know the data and tools to estimate it, but also um, you know better communication within supply chains about how um, your relationship to farmers. And we see a lot of uh, companies that are trying to enroll farmers in various types of programs um, in order to incentivize the types of practice changes that that we need to achieve uh, 1.5 futures. So. Yeah, I think that uh, you know, building on that work, I know you're <laughs> at Indigo. You do a lot of work to, to to try to you know make those connections and to to try to bring some of the farmers on board into the conversation. And um, I just I feel optimistic about about that space and, and where that might go in the coming years. Yeah, I feel like you have to be a little bit of an optimist mm -hmm. to work on some of this. Um, and you know, kind of moving then from talking about innovation to collaboration as you mentioned, some of the needs to link up these different actors in a value chain. We've talked about a couple big building blocks over the mm -hmm. last couple of minutes. You know, we're looking at the capacity building need. We've talked about data sets. We've talked about the need to be able to follow a commodity through the supply chain. When you look towards the big collaborative opportunities on the table to really scale this up internationally, to move the whole space forward, what would you ideally like to see in this space? Where do we need to start rolling up our sleeves and working together on things? Yeah, I think one of the things that um, is is really needed is just education around a lot of this. You know, we we work with some of the the leading experts and some of the companies that are really the leaders in this space of trying to set targets. Um, but there's there's a lot of work that needs to be done on on all sides of the value chain. You know, I think um, we we were hearing in the workshops this uh, this last day about uh, the need to to help better educate producers on what their opportunities are and how they might um, understand the sort of nuances between these different programs and offerings that might be coming to them. Um, I think on the company side, you know, while there's some consumer goods companies that uh, have already have built their teams and they know the right people to be talking to, I think there's a lot that are still early on their sustainability journey um, and, you know, just now coming to the realization and trying to set targets and trying to better understand their supply chain. Um, so I, I, I think there's there's just a lot of like, education out there to do first, and then to really help companies think through their climate action plan to to actually build their inventories and go through the different categories where they think that they can actually mitigate some of these impacts on the land, and, and to identify those strategies and to build programs that are going to allow them to to achieve that. So I would say you know. We're only seeing <laughs> some of the leading companies really have that full picture of what it's going to take to get to their targets. And so many others are, are still just trying to get up to speed and to understand what it takes to really set a target and to understand your impacts. So I think there's going to be a lot of work to be done in the coming decade to, to really get companies there. But I'm, I'm pretty optimistic about, you know, just the path that a lot of these companies are on and, and where it might go, whether that's, you know, continued voluntary efforts or through future regulations and other programs. 
Yeah, and a, a last question for you. As you look towards that next decade, as you look towards getting this work push out from beyond a, a leading group of companies to become business as usual for the next decade, mm. are there particular ways where you'd hope we can work to speed things up or where we might look to other actors in government, in the value chain, in the private sector to try to accelerate the pace of change? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. Um, and, and I do think that there's an important role for policy to play in this space. But um, I think through at least my own <laughs> career, I, I have seen, you know, kind of the need for voluntary initiatives to really build that understanding and to, to bring a lot of companies on board to the point that it would become more palatable to regulators to, to really understand because, you know, even, even we're faced in our program of like, well, you know, there's not a lot of the data, there's not a lot of this. And the only way that you can get there to build the data and to build that understanding and um, to, to be able to, to kind of regulate that for, for maybe some of the laggards who aren't coming on board to this is, is to build that base of knowledge and to, to really build that capacity. So I think that's where I, I try to stay optimistic about where companies are going and trying to, to understand their value chain impacts that, um, you know, then could allow the ease of you know regulation and policy to to you know make stricter rules around this. But um, yeah, I think if we continue to just do voluntary initiatives, uh, I don't I don't think we're going to be able to make the the changes that we need to 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 really secure 1.5 C futures. Absolutely, it's time to get going on that. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so Matt, you've talked about your capacity building work, your work mm -hmm. in field trials. It's taken you all over the globe. Are there moments in those travels that have really driven home the critical nature of getting agriculture right in order to hit that 1.5 degree target? A lot of times I was really impressed by the data collection effort. So I can give like two examples. I think one, um, as you know, collecting soil samples is not an easy task and it involves a lot of like field campaigns. It involves a, having a lot of partnerships, you know, with farmers on the ground. And I remember when I was working with uh, in Kenya, I got the opportunity to meet with some of their soil scientists and to, to see some of the sampling and some of the maps that they had just recently produced and was just very impressed that, uh, you know, you hear a lot of this on how in developing countries they don't have the same access to data, yet here I was seeing this <laughs> uh, soil map that had just recently been developed by some of the um, Kenyan uh, soil scientists and uh, was just really impressed with the ability to, to get out there and, and do some of the sampling and to try to um, understand the different conditions that they're, they're working in and then to be able to leverage that to, to better understand practices that they might need to implement. Um, the other one I would say on the forestry side would be when I was working in Uganda um, where you know we, we, we might use satellite remote sensing to understand forest cover, but you really need to send people out into the field, um, and in, in this case out into some of these uh, tropical forests to, to do the sampling. And it's not easy work. Um, you know, uh, they were telling me stories about how they would have to send crews in to some of these remote uh, areas of Uganda, and it's brutal work where they could be gone for like weeks on end in camps to, to go out and do the biomass sampling. Um, and I, th I think that just gave me so much appreciation <laughs> for what really goes into getting these on the ground measurements and um, seeing that it's such a global effort that uh, you have researchers from around the world who are doing this. Um, yeah, it was uh, yeah. very harrowing because I, <laughs> while I like to go out and <laughs> do some of that on my own, I, I don't think I uh, can say that I have, uh, you know, trekked through the jungle to do soil sampling in the way, or biomass sampling in the way that some of these other researchers have. That's some incredibly hard won yeah. data. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I, I have a follow-up question to that. So as you're thinking about this discussion of a, a need for data from the global south, which I, I think there's a lot of consensus on, but very few people have been out collecting biomass samples in the jungles mm -hmm. of Uganda, what do you think it's going to take for us to get there to have the kind of data we talk about wanting to have from areas where maybe there is data, but it isn't mm -hmm. you know, perhaps accessible in the way it could be, or where we'd like to see some data, but the difficulty of acquiring it can be really high. Yeah, I mean, I think that's where we just need to leverage the people on the ground and the, the producers who are out there, because I think there's been a lot of, um, you know, 
really great emerging technologies that are, are trying to make it easier for some of these producers. You know, they, they have a lot on their mind uh, than, than worrying about some of the greenhouse gas balances, um, but, but really putting that in their hands because, you know, they're the ones who understand the systems best. And um, so I, I think there's, there's a lot of new technologies that are, you know, trying to, to enter that space. And I, I can think of, you know, one of the, when we were doing this greenhouse gas inventory development, um, one of the really fun things that uh, some of my colleagues would lead is they call these uh, mapatons, where you would go through and, you know, you take the satellite imagery, um, but you need to, to ground truth the points to, to confirm what types of land uses were. And they would actually leverage a lot of, you know, the local governments who have a better understanding of these systems to understand, you know, what different agricultural, uh, you know, whether cropping systems, grazing systems look like in the country, and they would do the validation and, and the spot checks to improve um, some of the over time. So, you know, I think really leveraging that kind of local knowledge um, in order to improve our data sets that are out there and, um, you know, increase our ability to model some of these uh, different practice changes is, is really important. Yeah, so it sounds like you really can't get there unless you get the local producers and the local communities on board. Oh, absolutely. I mean, that's that's who we need to be engaging with, who we need to be incentivizing, and you know, really be able to bring a lot of this to them. Which, you know, I think we have a lot of <laughs> ways to go on that, but uh, yeah. we we hope to be getting to engage more on that end um, in the in the coming years. I think, though, when we talk about the interest you're seeing from leading companies to really mm -hmm. try to get the science right to engage their value chain, and we look at the way the industry is maturing in terms mm -hmm. of the data, in terms of the guidances, what kind of opportunities do you hope that opens up for producers to mm -hmm. perhaps get compensated for some of the work they're doing or to be able to have it meaningfully connect contextualized in some of the larger climate urgency? You know, I I don't envy a lot of these, you know, farmers, ranchers out there who, you know, I think want to be doing the right thing. They're really interested in it. But, you know, do they have the time to be learning all of these uh, very wonky, like carbon accounting terms and things like that? So I, I think that there really needs to be programs out there that, that can be accessible to farmers that can really help translate a lot of these impacts and, you know, take take the burden off of the producers to, to you know, you know, ensure that they're engaged in it and that they understand the, the you know, the data that's needed um, and how that's being used so that it's not being used in ways that they might be concerned with. Um, but uh, yeah, I think, you know, finding those those kind of partnerships that, that can enable this. Um, and I think really, um, like, you know, going back to the accounting perspective, I think we also need programs to, you know, make a lot of these uh, accounting uh, that needs to be done realized. You know, it's, it, it's difficult if every individual company is doing it themselves um, to, to really find a system that works where you're not double claiming different effort that's out there that, you know, you're being able to invest in technologies to do the modeling and the data collection. You know, if every every individual company is doing that, I, I don't think we're going to get to the, the futures we need or it's going to be a lot of lost investment that's not being given back to the producers who are actually driving the changes. So um, that's where I, I hope that uh, a lot of this work goes and, and can really put a lot of that um, investment in the mitigation action that's needed. That tie back to making sure you actually get the incentive linked up with the person who needs to make the change is something we're trying to work on as well. And there's some yeah. inherent barriers to, to making sure you're doing that right. Definitely. Yeah. And I, I don't know, it's one of the unfortunate things is like being somebody who works in the space of like the, the middle people, it's like, I, I worry that a lot of that in investment money isn't making it there. And I like I don't want a world where we continue to just fund consulting groups and things like that. <laughs> yeah. Like it needs to move beyond to, to the people who are driving the change. So absolutely. Yeah. Thanks so much for, for spending some time with us mm -hmm. today. I do think this is a space a lot of people are trying to watch and trying to get their arms around. And so being able to have a little bit of time to dig in is just wonderful. So. Yeah, yeah, happy to let you go. Thanks so much for uh, inviting us out here. It's always great to connect with uh, some of the other people on the ground who are doing a lot of great work as well. And you know, as we wrap up this uh, guidance development process and, and get our publication out, we, we hope that it's going to be put to good use. And you know, we need to be all working together to to try to implement the changes that we need. Couldn't agree more. <laughs> Thanks, Thanks so much, Matt.